the redeemed of the Lord say so Because the world needs to know Let the redeemed of the Lord say so Because the world needs to know Let the redeemed of the Lord say so Because the world needs to know Let the redeemed of the Lord say so Because the world needs to know Greetings, welcome to Say So Where we talk about it, whatever it is Because what you do not know can hurt you So let's get to the root For today's episode of Say So I am going to talk about it IT which stands for intimacy trauma. And it was about November of last year when Holy Spirit um, revealed to me another uh, acronym or definition for it. Because as you know, when I start the show, I always say, let's talk about it, whatever it is. Now, intimacy trauma is a very layered uh, topic and subject matter. And we're going to dig into it and get to the root of it and get some understanding on things um, as it pertains to intimacy trauma, specifically what it is, also examples of it or intimacy trauma, causes of it, types, five types of intimacy, and five levels of intimacy. Because there's levels to this thing, right? And as well as three signs of a trauma bond and lack of intimacy, what exactly that looks like. And number eight, we're going to bring it on home with how do I, you, we overcome it, intimacy trauma. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. And on a previous episode, I believe it was the previous episode, uh, 104, entitled uh, Stopping the recidivism cycle where I shared a little bit about a, uh, event actually that recently happened last, the end of last month on March 25th. So it was the last Saturday of the month and, um, it was called, let's talk about it. And, um, this was intimacy trauma and I thought it needed and necessary. I felt a pull, um, to, bring women together so we could just have these conversations um, and just throw it all out on the table. And um, there were those of us who have had experiences with it. There were those who may not have had experiences with it, but it was basically to raise awareness. And it was basically, like I said, to have those tough conversations that we may not typically be able to have or have a safe place, um, an open and honest space to have those conversations. So let's talk about it. Intimacy trauma happens because you have experienced some rough childhood stuff, right? L- examples like emotional, sexual, or physical abuse from a parent, a caregiver, or caretaker, or you were neglected and or abandoned as a child. And I think it's, uh, let me just put a pin in this and also um, want you to know and to note that sometimes depending on what the abuse is, it's more impactful depending on who did it. Like if it's a parent, that's major intimacy trauma because your parents are not supposed to be the ones that abuse you. They're not supposed to be the ones that take advantage of you, exploit you or hurt you purposely in any way, shape or form form caretaker you think of somebody caring for you in the absence maybe of your parents you the expectation is for them to be as close as possible to your parents when caring for you doing some of the same things having the same amount of love providing the same amount of nurturance and encouragement or whatever or what have you and when that does not happen like I said it 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 stings a little deeper or goes a little deeper when it's those that you have trusted and those that you would typically expect to have your best interests at heart and not neglect or abandon or abuse you, right? Now, it talks about as an adult, um, this is the the residue, um, this is uh, how it leaves something or deposit on the inside of you. As an adult, now this is the child who experienced rough, tough stuff, right? This leaves you feeling out of control with your emotions and or behavior. So it's important to know and to note that it may have started or initiated in childhood, but it carries over into adulthood, if not dealt with, intervened, um, and, and healed, 
right? So the next thing we're going to talk about is examples of it. Intimacy, trauma. And they are as follows. Trusting um, with important matters and decisions. So this is uh, intimacy. And when you have issues within that arena of your life. Now, an unwillingness to share your dreams and goals. Purposely sabotaging relationships once you begin to get close to other people or avoiding physical contact. So basically, if you know of anyone, and it could be you, that you know you sabotage relationships, you may have a time limit that everything goes fine for about the first six months to a year or two years tops. And then something happens, whether it be uh, basically when they talk about sabotaging, it's basically on your on your behalf. It could be that you decide to cut out on the person or you decide to do something that you know is likely going to be the end of that relationship. So you're purposely sabotaging sabotaging that because you may be afraid of intimacy. So you don't want to go past a certain level of intimacy with this individual and not necessarily just them with anyone. So that also feeds into the unwillingness to share your dreams and your goals. You may keep a guard up or a defense mechanism, a wall, if you will, that you, I'm not letting them come any further than this. I'm going to keep them at arm's length or what have you. And, um, That's just another example, avoiding physical contact because physical contact is one of the types, kinds, or forms of intimacy expressed. So you may not want to be physical at all with this individual simply because that's your way of keeping them at arm's length. If I don't allow you to come close, even close counters or whatever, close encounters or what have you, then I'm in control. And that's important to know and to note because they said you feel out of control with your emotions. So what what tends to happen when you don't feel that you have control or you've as a child when you were neglected you didn't have control over that um as a child when you were abused or abandoned you didn't necessarily have control over that you also did not or may not have had control over who did it whether it was a parent whether it was a sibling whether it was a friend a cousin um a caretaker or caregiver whomever it was that victimized you in that way. You didn't necessarily have control. So when you get older and you understand control, you develop a mindset that, okay, I couldn't control it then or me then or others then, but I'm going to do it now. And basically it's a defense mechanism. It's a way for you to feel it's a false, honestly, sense of safety. Like, okay, they're not going to hurt me because I keep them at arm's length. I don't really trust them. I don't share intimate things with them. I don't allow them into my uh, close personal space or what have you. So I'm in control because I can tell them how far they can go and how far they cannot. So I just set up um, boundaries and parameters around myself in order to protect me. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is what causes it, intimacy, trauma. Now, there are many roots, okay, that cause root causes of intimacy trauma. Most can be attributed to a traumatic childhood, which we spoke about, and experiences such as verbal abuse, which comes out of your mouth. Physical abuse happens with your hands. It's hitting or touching or, or doing something, grabbing or what have you, what have you, uh, someone. Or sexual abuse, that's abusing them sexually, it has to do with your private parts, your intimacy areas, and things of that nature. And it can go as far as exposing them to pornography or exposing them to things, allowing them to hear, see, and experience things that are not age appropriate, that a child should not, or what have you. And it also happens in at, at for teens, happens for uh, young adults, it happens for women, men, um, and the like. Emotional neglect. So not caring for your emotions. It it would be like you're crying, you're hurting, maybe you hurt yourself. And then your parent or the person that you trust or that you expect to come to help, they just walk over you and tell you get over it or or, or wipe your face and, 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 you know, whatever or what have you. Not really attending to your emotions or your emotional state, either ignoring them completely, minimizing them. Oh, that's so stupid. Just shut up. That It's not that big a deal, whatever. Move on or what have you. So not having your emotions validated is another issue or concern. And substance abuse. That's basically what it is, abusing a substance. It could be 
uh, something like cigarettes. It could be smoking weed. It could be alcohol. It could be popping pills. It could be uh, any anything, any substance that is abused. And abuse comes in when you misuse something. You use it more often than you should. Um, you use it for different reasons than it may have been prescribed to you for or given to you or supplied to you for. And so basically the substance abuse would happen in the home. So this is with a child or with a teen or you know, whomever. Someone in your residence is abusing substances. And of course, with substance abuse, there's a lot of fluctuation with your emotions and your feelings. And you may be really mean or you may be depressed or you may be, you know, passing out. There's a lot of behavioral things that come along with substance abuse especially in the home when you have to live with it and live around it. Now, the death of a parent is also intimacy trauma because you may have been extremely close to that parent. And once again, that control factor or that control mindset comes in and says, okay, I was hurt when this person passed away and it could be unexpectedly or it could be a terminal illness or what have you. But the fact that I lost this person, I'm not going to lose another person or I'm not going to allow another person close enough to me for their loss to affect me the way this loss did. Uh, it also says exposure to or experience in rejection and rejection is, is common, especially in childhood. You may want to play with a group of girls and they don't want to play with you. You uh, may not may not feel like you fit in or you belong anywhere. You may um, not be really confident or know who you are and you're trying to figure this out. So you're trying to fit in different um areas, different groups. You, you may want to be popular. You may try athletics. You may try a lot of different things trying to figure out where you fit. And um, your peers could figure out, hey, this, this is not really your thing. Like you, you're not, you're no good at this or what have you. Your teachers, you may say, hey, this is what I want to do when I grow up. And you, you may have a teacher that says, uh, that's, an, you, you might want to look at this because that's not going to happen or whatever. So basically um, people rejecting you. Um, you're open for relationship or communication or to uh, try to interact with this individual. And they're like giving you talk to the hand. They're giving you the hand. They're giving you the silent treatment. They're avoiding you. They're ignoring you. They may not return your texts or your calls or whatever or what have you. Uh, in essence, they're rejecting you. And the next thing that we will delve into is going to be... The five, count them, one, two, three, four, five types of intimacy. Now, remember, and let's just review that intimacy refers to a level of closeness. So how close you will allow somebody to get or how far you choose to keep them away from you. Now, where you feel now, when you allow them to come close and intimacy is healthy, you should feel validated and safe in relationships. We're going to talk about the five types of intimacy uh, that are key. Now, number one is physical. Number two is emotional. Number three is mental. Number four is experiential. And number five is spiritual. So the first one is physical and that's just hugging, holding hands, kissing, cuddling, um, and skin to skin contact. Now, what, uh, the physical one, like physical touch, made me think of uh, one of the five love languages, okay, which is physical touch. Another one is quality time, which cuddling made me think of quality time because, you know, your uh, significant other may want to curl up with you and watch a movie and eat some popcorn or whatever, where you guys fall asleep or whatever, what have you. You're, you're just close. You're hugging or what have you. Um, and also this physicalness is also ways that we show affection. We show that we care, we love uh, and support or whatever, uh, or are attracted to that there's chemistry. All of these things happen with physical type of intimacy. And the, the last one, skin to skin, made me think of uh, how, you know, mothers, and when we have children, or oh, they even bond with their fathers or whomever, but after a child is born, it's really important for them to have that skin to skin contact, to feel the warmth of your skin. Like I said, to hear your heartbeat, to hear your voice, all of these things is solidifying the intimacy from them, which they've known all of these things, uh, or at least your voice and your heartbeat and everything from the inside of your body but once they come on the outside it's important to reinforce that your mommy is still here or what have you and like I said you can do that with a uh, father as well dad take he who need to take off his shirt and there need to be skin to skin contact with the infant um, or newborn 
So um, that also we're going to talk a little bit about uh, bonding, okay, trauma bonds specifically. Next, we're going to go to emotional. Now, this is a critical factor in any and every relationship or interaction with another person, feeling emotionally supported. So this is being able to share your deepest, most personal feelings, all right, with this individual. And it's reciprocal. They're sharing their deepest, most personal feelings with you as well. Um, and basically, this should foster a feeling of safety, a feeling of security, and uh them affirming you, feeling like you, you're understood and feeling like you're cared for and that your emotions matter. Number three is mental, or you can refer to it as intellectual intimacy. Now, this is sharing your ideas, your opinions, questions, and other thoughts, considering the other's perspective as well. So this puts me in the mind of like maybe a business partnership where, you know, you guys are very intelligent and you can have... um intelligent conversations about business, about um, maybe brainstorming ideas for how this we can get this project off the ground or this business idea or whatever, what have you. But this is basically bringing, you know, uh, being able to exchange ideas and things with someone who is mentally capable of understanding, mentally capable of processing. And they may be they may have more um, information on an area or a topic or a subject where they can pour into you and tell you, have you ever thought about this? Or have you heard this? Have you researched this uh, or whatever or what have you? So, and it's vice versa. You know, you pour, they pour. Basically, it's, it's mutual and you're just pouring into each other uh, mentally. Like I said, your thoughts and your feelings and things of that nature. So that's a level of intimacy as well. And a lot of people experience this in the workplace. And... Uh, the next one is experiential and it's shared experiences, basically. So these happen sometimes in the beginning of your uh, relationship. When you think about how you met, maybe you shared time and space, even if it was just for a moment um, when you two met and maybe you connected later or what have you. But just having that shared experiences is what they're talking about with experiential, right? Um, examples are spending time together. The more time you spend together, the more memories you have and the more things you can talk about. This happened to us. Um, do you remember when we tasted this for the first time or went to this movie and we, we saw it together for the first time? So a lot of times there's a lot of firsts that happen with the experiential. And, you know, your first, you typically remember because it's something new. You don't have anything to compare it to. Therefore, it usually leaves an indelible imprint in your mind and your heart or what have you. So in addition to spending time uh, pursuing activities together and uh, participating in hobbies together. So maybe somebody's hobby is playing tennis or something. So you guys go to, to the gym or go to an outdoor tennis court to play tennis or what have you. Uh, or whatever. It could be biking. It could be walking. It could be jogging. Anything. Uh, lifting weights. Being uh, in an aerobics class. Anything like that. But you do it together, which makes it... Um, which allows your intimacy to grow because you're having more experiences together and you're having, like I said, shared memories and shared experiences. And the last one, number five, is spiritual. Now this could be, but is not limited to religious ideas and um, beliefs. It's also sharing your values. What makes you you? What makes you different? What are things that you value that others may not value as much? You know, what's at the top of your list and what's at the bottom of your list? Um... It could be health. It could be wellness. Um, it could be just sharing different aspects of your life with this person. You could tell them what your uh, morning routine is or your nighttime routine or what, you, what your work day is like and things of that nature. If you go to the gym or what have you, if you go to Bible study or prayer meeting or if you have a prayer time or a devotion time or what have you, these are the sorts of things that will go or fall up under the spiritual uh, type of intimacy. And next, we are going to explore what are the five stages of intimacy and the stages and or levels, because like I said, there's levels to this thing. So basically, uh, psychologists have identified five levels of emotional intimacy. So this has to do with your emotions that a person experiences as they get to know someone. So we're going to start with level one, which is actually the lowest level. And it goes from level one and builds up almost like a pyramid from the bottom to the top. 
So level one is safe communication. When you don't really know this person, but you're sort of feeling your way and you're trying to determine, you know, whether or not you two can have safe communication, what you can communicate about, what you can't, what's a good idea, what's not such a good idea, what's comfortable, what's not comfortable or what have you. Level two is the next to the lowest and it's others' opinions and beliefs. So basically sharing things that you read, you might've read, um, article or you may have read something in a magazine or the newspaper um, or something like that. You feel uh, something. You're also sharing opinions and beliefs of somebody that you trust and um, and believe in or what have you. So that's the second level. So it's really not, it hasn't even really gotten personal because you're getting to know with the safe communication and then you're sharing, oh, well, this is other, you know, this is my mom says this, or she taught me this way or what have you. So it's about other people at this point, but come level three, which is the moderate level, it's where you feel safe enough to share your personal opinions and beliefs and try that out and test the waters there and see, um, if it's emotionally safe to do so. Now, level four is the high level. And basically, you're sharing feelings, you're sharing dreams, you're sharing goals, and just good things about yourself and or your background. So is it, you're getting a little closer, you're digging a little, mo- a little more deeply into who you are, and you're feeling you know safe at this point, prayerfully. Now, the fifth and final level is your needs, your emotions, and your desires. This is the highest level, and this is the ultimate goal for any and every relationship. Um, So at this level, you are willing to share your fears, your needs, and your challenges. So not just the good stuff, which was at the high level, but also the negative stuff, or not necessarily negative, things that you would like to improve on, or things that you may not be 100% proud, proud that this is your challenge, your struggle, or that this is, you know, something that you're grappling with, but you feel that you can trust this person enough to share that, and that this is a safe place and space to do so, Right. Also, this is where emotional reactions come into play. So you, there could be something happened. Somebody may have passed away or something like that. And you may become vulnerable or emotional, or you may be talking to them about some really, really deep things and things that you are struggling with or have been challenged with and the root of them. And you may become emotional in some way. Yet you, at this point, it's a safe place and a safe space to be emotional. And like I said previously, have your emotions validated and um, justified, and what have you. Now we are going to move to what are three signs of the trauma bond? Number one, and when I read these, it puts me in the mindset of a domestically violent relationship. And when you, when you hear it, um, you'll probably align right with that. So the first one is you agree with the abusive person's reasons for treating you badly. Okay. So a lot of times when there's domestic violence, sometimes it's seen as safer to side with the abuser or the predator simply because it's typically a love hate relationship. They love you as much as they hate you. Right? So when things are going good, it's so, Oh my God, it's over the, over the heel with the affection over the heel with the, Oh, I just love you. You're so this and you're so this, the compliments and whatever, what have you, they're just lavishing you with all of this talk and maybe even gifts or whatever, what have you. You're the best thing since sliced bread. They've never had anybody like you never had a relationship like this or whatever, what have you. Now, then the uh, second one is, oh, so as I was saying, so with an abusive or domestically violent relationship, it's safer to be on their side because if you're not, you're either their uh, friend or their foe. If you're their foe, they're going to treat you 100% like an enemy. There is no mercy. There is no, uh, I apologize. There is none of that. Um... You're, you're almost like not even human. So some women opt to, or men or some victims opt to side with the predator or the abuser simply because it's safer. Um, people like police officers, when they come to a scene, it's the, those that involve domestic violence are the most cantankerous. They're the most volatile. They're the most unpredictable because a individual, the victim could have called the police. Yet when they come and begin to arrest or begin to accost or begin to, you know, um, 
I was about to say bind the strong man in a way spiritually. Yes. But when they began to, you know, um, have them to put their hands behind their back and cuff them or what have you, the person who called the police will then begin to fight the officer or be, you know, begin to be belligerent or whatever. Don't hurt him or don't hurt her or whatever, or what have you is, is, is really unpredictable. And it's, it's really not a safe situation, but anybody in law enforcement will tell you that that's the most volatile. That's the most dangerous, if you will, uh, call to get. So the second thing is they will try to cover for the abusive person saying things like, uh, he didn't mean it. She didn't mean it. They were just upset. They were just so stressed. You know, they, they, they just lost their job. They just, this, they just, that they're going to justify and or cover. They may even lie for the person. Um, you may ask them what happened to your eye and they will say, Oh, um, I walked into the the, into the corner of the cabinet and it blacked my eye. Okay. All right. So they're trying to cover because they don't want you to know that, that, that the abusive person is abusing them or that there is a perpetrator, uh, because you may know that they are married or they have a significant other or a baby daddy or who their current boyfriend is. So in order to cover, they'll put the blame on themselves. Number three, argue with or distance themselves from people trying to help such as, Friends, family, members, or neighbors, and also church members, anybody, colleagues, um, people that classmates, people that they go to school with, like anyone that they come in contact with. And part of this is part of the isolation because there is a trauma bond because of the trauma they've uh, experienced. It's a cycle that they actually go in. So there's honeymoon at the beginning. Everything is all good. Then there's tension building. So this person, the mask is getting ready to come off. It hasn't completely come off yet. Right. Until the explosive stage. Then once they explode and, and, and you everything but a child of God and they cuss you out and put their hands on you and all this and all of that, then comes the honeymoon period again, because now they're sorry. And now they're never going to do it again. And you're once again, you're the best thing since sliced bread. So they lavish you with gifts, compliments, everything like that. And trying to, to make it look like uh, everything is okay. Like the Sprite commercial says, image is everything. Obey your thirst. Image is everything for them. So they may come to your job with gifts and people are like, wow, I wish my husband or my significant other would come to come, come to my job and do this and do that and be so sweet and be so thoughtful and all of that. What they don't understand is what preceded that behavior. And let's see. So basically, yes, isolation. If... They don't want you to have friends. So they don't like your friends. They have to find something wrong with every friend. Oh, she don't like me. Oh, you see the way she was looking at me. Oh, she want me. She this, she that. They have to find a way for you to push people away that could actually help. People that you would actually listen to their opinion. People that have actually, you've had intimacy uh, with stronger than them and have been in your life longer than them. But they want to, um, what do you call it? Eliminate the competition, so to speak. They want to be the only voice speaking in your ear. And family members, uh, your mama don't like me. Your brother don't like me. Did you see how he disrespected me or how she did this? She didn't even ask me this or whatever, what have you, uh, neighbors, them neighbors knows it. Why they in our business? Blah, 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 woo, woo, skippy. So those are just some examples. Now we're going to move to what does lack of intimacy look like? Because we talked about how, uh, well, this perfectly segues because we talked about how the, uh, the ultimate goal is to have you to push people away from you and out of your sphere of influence so that they can have the complete and total influence. They become your entire world. If they, if you permit or allow them to, they become your whole world and you don't have any support. You don't have any loved ones around. You've offended them or you've cut them off completely for this person or whatever, what have you. So they have your ear. They're the only person that can talk into your ear and they try to become your world. So what does lack of intimacy look like? Because now you're lacking in intimacy area with friends and family members, church members, classmates, colleagues, or what have you. So you're feeling isolated. And um, you only have an intimacy trauma bond with this person. So what is a lack of emotional intimacy? A relationship that lacks emotional intimacy are characterized by feelings of isolation. We just talked about that. Disconnection. All right. They want to disconnect you from everything and everyone that loves you. And because they want to make you believe that 
only they love you or nobody loves you like they can or whatever, what have you. And a lack of emotional safety. Okay, so this would be the person where they black your eye. You might be on the ground crying and they step over you and say, go fix your hair. You look, well, shut up, get up and, you know, or whatever have you. So your emotions don't matter. All right. And they're emotionally cold and callous. They may give you the silent treatment like it's your fault. You provoked me. You made me do this. You made me say that when ultimately it's them. They made the decision. They made the choice. They have lack of self-control and they have anger issues and they're the violent one. So uh, but they will your emotions. No, you just crazy. I, I ain't do that. I just pushed you a little bit. You didn't. You the one flew into the wall. OK, yes. So. Lack of emotional safety. And at this point, is is lack of physical safety as well. Lack of mental safety. So all of these previous types of intimacy that we talked about, none of these areas are safe at this point. Now, even though there's time spent together, there's no real emotional connection or understanding between the both of you. And I was looking at something on YouTube, and I think she it was the one with the five levels to it. Um, and the lady said that sex masks intimacy and we feel closer than we really are because of sex. You, you've given them the best of you. You've given them your treasure. You've given them the, the greatest part of you, you know, so it makes you feel like you're close and all of that. And some, in some relationships, they try to use sex to make up, like make up sex and all of that stuff. Um, to make you feel like you still have an attachment or that you're still close or you're still intimate when that's not the case usually. So basically there's no real emotional connection because as previously spoke, you didn't go through the stages where you're trying to see if the communication is safe. If you can share about others, if you can share your personal experiences and your personal thoughts and feelings, you skipped all of those and you went straight to, you know, having sex or you went straight to, or maybe you guys talked for let's say four to five hours and you went over all that stuff. You went through the whole conglomerate of other people's opinions, your dreams, your visions, your goals, where you want to go, the challenges. You tell them all about your uh, your your traumatic or turbulent childhood. You guys begin to bond over that. That's where that trauma bond happens because you both experienced trauma. And the sad thing about it is likely neither of you have gotten healed from that trauma. So that trauma is still there. So what's going to happen is once you get in a relationship, you begin to trigger each other purposely or not purposely. Um and so that makes it worse, but yet you're, you're still bonded because of that trauma and you feel close to them because you feel like, oh, he understands. She understands. She's been where I am. She, she wasn't raised with this person or that person. She was neglected. She was abandoned. He was neglected or abandoned or abused or what have you. So this is, this is, this is the one for me, you know, because they understand me. They get me. Yet they're the person that's doing the same thing to you. That's neglecting your emotional state or your feelings. That's uh, abandoning you or giving you the cold shoulder when your love language is physical contact or or being served or um, quality time. And, and they use that against you. So um, those are just some real life examples of how it goes down sometimes. And now we are going to, let me just double check, make sure we covered everything. And thus far, it appears that we have. So we're almost done. Now that we've talked about it, intimacy trauma. We've talked about trauma bonds. We talked about the different types of um, trauma. We've talked about the levels to getting to know someone and intimacy, right? We talked about what it's like to have a lack, what it looks like to have lack of intimacy. And if I could just say that there are times and it, it's even in my notes when you have lack of intimacy in a marriage. And although you're supposed to have someone to do things with a companion to do things, like I said before, your sports and do different activities with you or what have you, when there is an unhealthy level of intimacy, they don't really know you. They never took the time to get to know you. Um, and maybe you never took the time to get to know them. I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe you moved so quickly that you thought you were a lot closer, like, uh, than you actually were. Like the lady said, sex makes you, uh, gives you, uh, it masks, uh, it makes you think that you're closer than you actually are because you've been uh, intimate intimate with this person on this level. Doesn't mean that they respect your emotions. It doesn't mean that spiritually they can uh, support 
your ideas, your values and uphold those the way that they should be upheld. It doesn't mean that intellectually they are a match or they can even, you can even have certain conversations with them because they may not even understand it. It may be over their head or what have you. Um, physicality that, that could be played on. Like I said, uh, if, if that's what you crave, then that's what they take away from you. They, um, you know, give you the cold shoulder or treat you really cold or harsh, um, or, or whatever, or what have you. And, um, you're feeling you've been neglected as a child and or abandoned. And now you're feeling neglected and abandoned and taken advantage of, um, and not uh, appreciated and all of that stuff in your marriage. So you're replaying that cycle because you found yourself in a, a marriage relationship situation that is true. That has lack of intimacy and it's traumatic. You have a trauma bond and not a healthy bond or not a true bond. Should I say now, Last but not least, we're going to go over how do I, you, me, we overcome it. Now, there are three things. They say, learn how to express your feelings. And a lot of uh, times like this part is neglected because if it's not safe for you to be angry, because if you're angry, they're angry because you're angry. Now they're physically abusive or cursing you out or whatever, because you're angry because you feel vulnerable or maybe someone did something to you or what have you. And they're, you know, it's, you can't even have your moment of being angry or being embarrassed or being sad or being down or whatever, what have you, because it upsets them that you are feeling those feelings. So you may get to the point where you just do not express them, where you almost have an ice grill or you just don't, your affect becomes flat. You don't have any emotions. You just become numb because it may be safer that way. Because when you show that you're vulnerable or that you're hurting or that something bothers you, it may be taken out of context or used against you as a weapon. So that's one of the things learning to express your feelings. One of the main issues that people recovering from um, trauma or traumatic encounter is knowing how to say how they feel in an effective manner. And sometimes people who have experienced a lot of trauma, they're really good at anger but they're not good at um, identifying what's underneath that. Why are you so angry? Why did you go from one to 1000 that quick? What is really at the, what is really the root issue? What is really, what are you really feeling? Um, it, it could be a feeling that you felt in childhood, or you may be insinuating or thinking someone is insinuating something that they're not. So it doesn't even have to be reality for you to react or feel the way that you feel. And then uh, your actions follow. You know, so it's important to know and to note that. Also, number two of how do we overcome it? Intimacy trauma is staying present and mindfulness. So basically, sometimes, like I said before, sometimes you become numb because it's just easier that way because you don't want to show your emotions because every time you do or talk about your feelings, your real feelings, because every time you do, it's uh, World War Three. You can't even have a moment because they're so explosive or so angry or so combative or so violent and aggressive that they get mad because you're mad or they get mad because you're crying or because you're hurt or because you expressed uh, an emotion, embarrassment or whatever, or what have you. So that's um, just something be so the opposite of that is being present. Feel when you're at when you find yourself at a safe place and space and you're able to be present, feel what you feel, talk about your emotions, learn how to safely and effectively communicate and be open and honest. Now, once again, this has to be a safe place. This can't be anywhere or everywhere, but uh, it's important that you learn that because sometimes when things happen to us as children, we don't learn the proper lessons or we don't learn as much about relationships or healthy relationships or what have you as we could have or should have with the, with the absence of whatever that trauma was, the absence of neglect or abuse or um, abandonment or what have you. So it's important that at some point we have to learn how to effectively communicate our needs and our wants. We have to learn um, and find places and spaces where our emotions are validated, justified, and it's okay to feel whatever emotion you're feeling. God gave us these emotions. So he didn't give them to us for us just to keep them stuffed in or us to never utilize them or whatever, what have you. Is needed and necessary. That's why we have them. We're equipped with them so we can use them, pull them out or whatever when it's needed and necessary and appropriate to do so. 
And last but not least, three says going to therapy. And it's important to know and to note that therapy is okay. Like it's okay to not be okay. And therapy may be where you need to find yourself. Um, I have three previous episodes that talked about what brought me to Christian counseling. So counseling or therapy may be an outlet for you and it can help to teach you what you did not learn as a child, teach you how to effectively communicate your needs and things of that nature, Uh, communicate your feelings without the fear that somebody is going to attack you or be upset or, you know, they turn, um, they turn on you because of how you feel or what have you. So it's important to know and to know that it could be life coaching. It may not be necessarily a therapeutic, uh, a therapy setting or a counseling setting. It could be life coaching that can help to pull out some of those things. If your coach is, you know, well-versed and able and willing to delve, um, to those, to those levels, uh, and delve that deeply and get to the root of some things. So whatever, um, you feel or find works for you, definitely do that. But once again, you, a lot of times, it's not effective or it's not um, helpful unless or until you're in a place that you are safe, that, you know, you can explore these things. You have uh, overcome uh, or come out of an abusive marriage or relationship or what have you, or an abusive friendship. This is not just limited to uh, situationships or marriages or uh, relationships, significant others, baby daddy and mama drama or what have you. Um, it's any interaction. You have a relationship where you've experienced betrayal or you've um, experienced uh, abandonment at some area or whatever when you thought that your friend or friends would be there and they didn't and you felt left alone and you felt isolated and betrayed or whatever, what have you. It could be family members. It could be church members. It could be church hurt. It could be family members. It could be um, colleagues, you know, the professional side of things. Um, It could also be classmates. So it could be a lot of different things. Some people experience this in their parent and child relationships. Uh, So it's just important to know and to know that um, you can. Overcoming is possible. And that should be your ultimate goal. And um, because as I said uh, in my book, Cast Down But Not Destroyed Destiny's Child, it's worth it to see what's on the other side of all this pain, this brokenness, and this long suffering. You didn't go through it for nothing. You and I, we, you, me, we, we didn't go through it for nothing. So um, we went through it to be a testimony and a testament that it, intimacy trauma, used to have me, but I now have it. Okay, so I'm stronger, I'm wiser, and I'm better because of it. And I can recognize it in someone else and help to pull them out by the grace of God. So that's all I have uh, today, but I definitely wanted to explore intimacy trauma because that's not something that we talk about a lot. And like I said, when Holy Spirit showed it to me, I was taken aback. I was just in awe because I had never put two and two together or never sized it up and known that it is can be an acronym for intimacy trauma. So that's all I have until next time. Remember that God and only God has the final say so about where you are now, where you have been and where you are going. You are simply in the process of becoming who and what God created, ordained, destined, designed and uh, purposed for you to be for his glory. Until next time, miracles and blessings today and every day.